Okay, this has been a, there's been a, there's a long uh, delay between the first program and the second one. And I apologize for that, but I'm sure now our team has geared up and we'll be having a feast of programs. Starting this month, we'll be having similar webinar next month. We'll be starting journal clubs and other activities uh, with our dynamic secretary, Dr. Chinmay, uh, guiding us along with. About today's webinar, today we're going to talk about some uh, case scenarios which are common in day-to-day -day practice. Uh, with the rapid advances in imaging and uh, fetal medicine in general, we are picking up more and more subtle abnormalities or uh, uh, malformations at various gestational stages, which we are not able to see some years back. And uh, with more and more such subtle findings being picked up, it is becoming more and more difficult to categorize them, to know their importance, and to offer adequate and appropriate counseling to the patients. Gone are the days when the easiest solution was termination of pregnancy. But uh, fortunately, nowadays it is not so. And there are various aspects to these common conditions. And we are fortunate to have three stalwarts of fetal medicine today with us. We have divided this uh, webinar into three topics uh, with some uh, clinical cases and some imaging uh, cases to be discussed. Uh, the first will be by Dr. Chinmay Umarji, who will be presenting a case about preeclampsia pre and preeclampsia uh, management and prevention. Uh, his case will be guided later on uh, by Dr. Kurana sir, who will tell us more about it. The second will be an imaging thing with uh, Dr. Yogesh Saudari presenting a case on CPAM and Dr. Praveen sir will elaborate on it and its uh, various aspects. And the last case will be a ventriculomegaly, which will be presented by me and Dr. Mohit Shah will be our expert in uh, and tell us about its management and various aspects about it. So uh, let us start with uh, Dr. Chinmay uh, with his first case. Chinmay, unmute yourself. Yes, you can unmute yourself. Thank you. So uh, I'll, I'll just share my screen. Uh, I would like to thank at the outset uh, SFM uh, and Dr. Sabnis uh, for giving me this opportunity to represent uh, Greater Pune chapter today. Um, in our first case, without further ado, uh, we had this 27 years old primary self referring to us uh, with high wave conception, history of cervical surplus at 18 weeks. At 22 weeks, uh, her fetal echo was suggestive of hypoplastic left heart. Uh, we confirmed that on the scan, and after counseling, we approached Supreme Court because at that moment, uh, the couple wanted permission to terminate. Later on, they changed their mind, so we withdrew our petition and a uh, patient was referred back to her gynecologist for further antenatal care. She was referred back to us by her primary obstetrician in view of eclampsia at 27 weeks of gestation, first episode of which happened in her clinic. And then uh, on her way to us, uh, she had another convulsion. When she reached to us, we started her uh, on magnesium sulfate and antihypertensives, stabilized her eclampsia and high blood pressure. Uh, scanned for uh, intrauterine demise slash abruption and there was no evidence of such. However, there was growth restriction, maybe well below third centile with deranged umbilical artery doppler and uh, absent endastatic flow. So we counseled a patient and her family and a decision of induction of labor was taken in view of eclampsia with low threshold for cesarean with FGR uh, because there was FGR with uh, eclampsia. We wanted to salvage mother's obstetric career. Uh, after two days of intensive labor, uh, she delivered. Uh, no surprise, there was a demise of a female 720 grammar at 20, 28 weeks. Uh, urine ACR, which was done uh, after six weeks uh, to rule out microalbuminuria, was normal. Now comes the interesting part. 2019, she conceives again, seven weeks this time, with another IVF conception. Uh, her anti-scan with enhanced first trimester 
uh, made her fall in high risk category actually sorry for the typo for which we timely started her on ecosprin uh, here are the findings for the same so if you look at, at the uh, data here in her previous pregnancy she had growth restricted baby with eclampsia and this was an art conception uh, when we looked at her uterine atp pi it was absolutely perfect however when you look at her biochemistry you'll see that although hcg and pap were normal phgf had started dropping at around 0.6 her mean arterial pressure was absolutely normal considering her previous history and low phgf uh, the software uh, classified her as high risk uh, for preeclampsia and intermediate risk for growth restriction we put her on ecosprin 150 mg as suggested by aspre trial we also did an early anomaly scan in view of her uh, previous uh, uh, cardiac defect and uh, we counseled her not, uh, she remember she had cervical encephalage before but this time the cervical length was absolutely normal at around 36 mm so we counseled her not to take any progesterone Uh, no cervical was done however at a normal and fetal echo we had again offered her transvaginal ultrasound for cervical length which were normal too we planned frequent antenatal visits every two weekly for in view of uh, previous eclampsia at around 28 weeks and uh, we checked her mean arterial pressure and urine albumin at each visit growth scans were offered at the interval of 4 weeks up to 32 weeks and after that when she came back for her further growth scan at 36 weeks her blood pressure had gone up even the previous scan had started showing that there was fetal growth restriction ctg was reassuring pih lab was normal so we induced her at 37 weeks and 2 days and we had a full term vacuum assisted vaginal birth for a 2.4 kilo male baby both baby and the mother are fine Thank you for giving me this opportunity to sharing. Over to you, to our expert, Dr. Khurana sir, uh, for further discussion, sir. Uh, thank you, Chinmay. That was an excellent presentation, as always. And uh, I'll take on from here uh, to guide people on what we really should be doing uh, with a background like this. And um, I just want to reconfirm that my screen is showing and that the video on page 1 is working absolutely sir wonderful so we will uh, we're talking about some common scenarios but where expectant management is the role the mm -hmm. question is when we talk about expectant management uh, truly speaking are we really going to do nothing for a patient like the one we have just seen or are we going to make sure that something needs to be done and really A, a test like the first trimester screen tells us that there may be trouble ahead, which means that yes, I have to follow some rules. We have several rules, and we will discuss them as we go along. The best of which are from the Fetal Medicine Foundation and an excellent practical course, virtually in the guidelines from ISWAG. So we will discuss these. But the idea really is to take you back a couple of years uh, to an article that came out uh, in the in the White Journal, which clearly said. that doing nothing is no longer an option which means that if i am doing something here i just have to absolutely make sure that when i get results from this investigation of my first trimester screening i have to do something and the result was based on this that the aspre project clearly showed us from its publication in the ajog 2019 february that if i give the correct amount of aspirin at the correct time to the patient i will shift the end point of the disease which is the uh, onset of preeclampsia that is critical where i need to deliver from this terrible red zone uh, where there is iatrogenic prematurity to a vast majority of them moving on to delivery beyond 37 weeks so this was absolute magic compared to what was happening to women before you heard the plight of what happened in this lady's first pregnancy and so let's go through some of the ways we understand this whole situation and how it's come about because we need to do something we need to do something because every year we have 10 million women around the world developing preeclampsia 
And there are 76,000 pregnant women who die each year from preeclampsia. And typically by the time this webinar is over, 10 women will be completely gone um, per hour. And that is, that is because you and me didn't know what to do. And then it has this terrible uh, risk on uh, infants because of the prematurity, their growth uh, restriction, et cetera, et cetera. And therefore we need to do things. The good news is that we're going to be able to look after at least one third of the causes of maternal mortality. And importantly, we're going to make a dent in two things. One is preeclampsia. The other is uh, growth restriction. And to a certain extent on preterm birth, although uh, iatrogenic uh, preterm birth is something we can't avoid completely. And we need to do it because in our part of the world, we do understand that unlike the usual uh, 4%, 3.7% uh, incidence of preeclampsia and eclampsia, in some parts of India, we have as high as 27% which means one out of every four or one out of every three girls is going to be a disaster in a pregnancy if we don't do anything. And as you've heard, the only real choice is to, is to deliver. The good news is that we now have an algorithm as uh, Chinmay has so beautifully shown us, which tells us a personalized risk for the entire population, including nulli perish women in the first trimester. If we get a screen negative, we are like 98, 99% sure that preeclampsia will not occur in screen negative women. In screen positive women, it lets us start the aspirin on time and this improves perinatal outcome. So we have an absolutely fantastic test which is available to tell us that, look, you can do something at the right time. Also, we now have some tests and we will uh, discuss this in the second half of my talk where surveillance and testing in later pregnancy facilitate prediction of preeclampsia, which means you will not just sit back and do expectant management passively. You will be an actively involved member in that girl's outcome because you're making sure that things are going right. So I will take you through some of the basic stuff, but more importantly, we do understand that screening for preeclampsia is now a very, very important part of the first trimester fetal evaluation that we do between 11 and 14 weeks. And it's something we cannot do without because truly speaking, we look at um, uh, Down syndrome, uh, one in a thousand pregnancies, and we look at preeclampsia, which is like a 27% incidence. There's no comparison in what we'll be able to do. Also, when we look at statistics, we do realize that compared to the amount of screening we do for other diseases, such as mammograms, colonoscopies, and uh, chest X-ray, low-dose CTs, et cetera, when we talk about the number needed to find patients that we are going to be able to get a, a screen positive, the first trimester screening test, uh, the combined test is going to really pick up a beautiful number for us, much, much better performance as a screen compared to what else is happening. And since we have treatment, which many of these other ones on the left-hand side do not, we're going to be able to do something for that baby and do something for that lady. Now, we must remember, of course, that we have to explain to our patients first that yes, uh, not every test is perfect. This is a screening test, which means that there will be a detection rate and some will be missed. Uh, those are called the false negatives, and some may never develop the disease, and those are called false positives. But those numbers in preeclampsia are small, and we must spot it. So far, what has been used until several, uh, just several years ago was just high-risk factors, moderate-risk factors, blah, 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 from the, from the UK, from the Americas, and from Australia. And they were a little ambiguous about when to start the aspirin and how much aspirin. And then we had this fantastic amount of data collected principally from the Fetal Medicine Foundation, which said that, look, even in the real world, at the beginning of the study, when we weren't so smart about this, we had a 75% detection rate at the beginning. Currently speaking, if you look at the O'Gorman study from 2017, we realized that we detect all the serious uh, preeclampsias, which are those that are before 32 weeks, the detection rate is 100%. And for the post 37 weekers, also we have an 80% detection rate, which is really fantastic. So it's really something that we cannot be able to do, to be doing without. We can skip Down syndrome, but we can't afford to skip preeclampsia because it has huge implications in terms of numbers. Let's try and understand what happens. You see, after the embryo implants, we do understand that the trophoblasts will occupy the spiral arteries. There'll be a first wave of eight, at eight to 10 weeks. 
a second wave at 16 to 18 weeks, which will then go until about 24 weeks. And the secret is to make sure that as many of the spiral arteries get replaced by trophoblastic cells and uh, the uh, endothelium just disappears. And that is why we need to start this whole stuff before 16 weeks, which is what the Canadians have been saying for 25 years now. What will result in a normal pregnancy is that a tightly bound vessel will become a loosely spiral vessel. It will become larger. So the requirements of blood for that pregnancy can be looked after. This does not happen in the preeclamptic patient. And this is what we facilitate in the hypertensive patient before she gets hypertensive. And we prevent hypertension. We prevent everything, really speaking. The cascade of events is really the same, not only just for preeclampsia, but also for other great obstetric syndromes like growth restriction, abruption, HELP syndrome and stillbirths. We know that because of abnormal trophoblastic invasion, there is placental ischemia. This results in endothelial activation. And this has two effects, a diffuse vasospasm and also microthrombosis, both of which can be looked after and prevented. Most important is the prevention. So when we talk about expectant management, it means that basically we don't say that, look, you're high risk, think twice about getting pregnant. Of course not. We say, look, we can do something but we will do an aggressive expectant management. We will treat you and we will try and prevent the disease or make sure that it is less severe. And do understand that all of this is based on uh, first trimester evaluation of PAPE and PLGF, both of which go down when there is a placental ischemia. Then later in pregnancy, you have PLGF going down further and SFLT, which is the new entrant going up. And this can be detected by a lab test. And then, of course, there's end organ damage, which is clinically so obvious that you don't need to do something. What we've been doing so far is the old fashioned method, which said, OK, we will take maternal factors. We will add on the biomarkers of uterine artery PI, mean arterial pressure, PAPA, PLGF, and then later on SFLT1, and then say, OK, we, we now fix this, which is nice. It worked pretty well for a while, except that you couldn't add on things as pregnancy developed. And we know that things change in pregnancy. You can detect things at uh, 20 weeks, which you cannot detect at 12 weeks. It's like saying, okay, I'm setting out for Mumbai and, the, and there's sunshine in Delhi, so there'll be sunshine in Mumbai. Of course not. And therefore we want to see where the clouds gather. So in order to see where the clouds gather, I like to make sure that yes, we shifted to a different model, which is the competing risk approach, which means that anytime I discover something new happening to my patient, I add that to my risk that I have calculated, put that into a mathematical model, which means I put it into software, which is already working with me. And I can give a fresh risk of what's going to happen in the next few days and in the next few weeks. And this is the advantage of the competing risks approach. If you don't understand mathematics, it really doesn't matter. All you have to know is that this exists, that you have to put in the figures and the answer and the treatment comes to you automatically. The conventional way of screening in the first trimester remains the same, maternal characteristics, uterine artery Doppler, mean arterial pressure, PAPI and PLGF, fed into uh, what I use, of course, is the, is the uh, FMF uh, calendar uh, um, calculator. And then to that, you add on the uterine artery flow. You get the right mid-side section of the uterus and cervix. You move to the side, and then you identify uh, the uterine artery. It's a little different on low-end machines, a little different on high-end machines. And we know the values are different uh, when you do a vaginal scan. Use an appropriate chart and make sure that this little reading that you get here at the peak of the wave is more than 60 centimeters. Then you know that you're actually picking up the uterine artery before it is branched off into spiral arteries and so on. And that's the point of picking it up. After it's given off the descending branch and continues as the main uterine artery upwards. So having done that, remember that between the transvaginal scans and the transabdominal scans, you have a slight difference. So you must use the appropriate chart. And also that it's not that you have a single cutoff. No, I won't say, okay, 3.1 up to 65 millimeters cutoff. It's easy to remember that. But when your machines have a chart on them and it's a gestational age related chart, it makes complete sense to actually use that. And that's what you should be doing. Now, this business of recognizing the patterns is important because all you have to do now is none of those other factors of RI and SD ratio or anything. You just sample it correctly. And when you do that, 
in the first trimester, you will almost always pick up this less flow at the end of the cycle and a notch in early diastole. Sometimes you might pick this up, um, but that's rare. So this business of a notch, we're going to discuss a little further. And once you get your PI, you do a right uterine artery, a left uterine artery, divide it by two and put it onto the chart and see whether it falls in correctly or not. But more importantly, put it into the software because uterine artery by itself is not perfect. When combined with others, it becomes more perfect. Which index to use? No arguing. We now use the PI and we only use the PI because it does not approach infinity when, uh, when uh, the uh, end diastolic flow is absent or when you have reversed uh, diastolic flows. Also, what about the notch? The notch is natural and almost half the cases will have a notch at 12 weeks. So what are we talking about? It's complete nonsense. We have enough evidence and I've put it into small print at the bottom. The evidence started coming in quite a while ago. We don't talk about the notch in 2021 and we will certainly not talk about it in 2022. We know that we will talk only about the PI and that's the way to go about it. In fact, there's no place for it in the software either. Mean arterial pressure has to be measured correctly and is beautifully described in literature and you can find excellent guidance on YouTube. And then of course, you just enter it and then remember that if you're trying to compromise, most of the chat box will be full. If I don't do this, then what will happen? If I don't do PAPI, what will happen? If I do PLGF and I don't do MAP, what will happen? What will happen is that you won't be as good. It makes no sense today to not try and reach the 100, 100, 100 predictability that we have for early preeclampsia. It's very, very important for you and me to realize that we try and use the whole thing for the best benefit. We should not be short-sighted. We should not be taken in by the government that says compromise, compromise, compromise. Tell the patient this is the best. It may not be available in my institution. My institution cannot afford it, but if you can afford it, get it done and document it on the report. Because today it is inexcusable to let a baby or a mother die when something could be prevented. So what else? What else is that we now have biomarkers and evaluation not only at 12 weeks, but also much later into the pregnancy. And for that, we have quite a bit of information. First of all, it took us almost two decades to do this, but it's now worked out very, very well. At 12 weeks, we assess mean arterial pressure, uterine artery PI and PLGF. Beyond 22 weeks, we include SFLT and also do PLGF, ideally. Uh, then at 32 weeks, you repeat all of that in 36 weeks, and we will talk about how we do it with different categories. Because we have realized for some years now that there is an angiogenic imbalance between PLGF, which is a good thing, and SFLT, which is a bad thing. So the stuff that is bad tends to go up. The stuff that is good, which is PLGF, tends to go down. And the ratio between them has been identified as a 38, uh, which is a good cutoff. Anything less than 38 is a good cutoff. 38 to 85 is not such a bad situation and greater than 85 is a disastrous situation when we compare it to pregnancy outcomes. Also, as you go through pregnancy and as you reach higher and higher levels, your misdiagnosis of preeclampsia, where for instance, she might just be hypertensive disease with a little bit of proteinuria happening from a leak in the, uh, in the kidneys because of an old uh, glomerulonephritis she had, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, or just uh, a urinary tract infection. And therefore, you really have to be careful and try and see how best to fit this in. How do we fit this in? Well, we look at the proteins that have worked. There are new proteins that are still being worked on. VEGF came and went. PP13 might come in the future. For now, we have placental growth factor, which is PLGF. And we have the full form of SFLT1, which is soluble FMS-like tyrosine kinase 1, and therefore it's such a uh, tongue twister, we use FLT1 uh, instead. When do we screen beyond the first trimester? And this is important. We screen um, whenever the patient has missed the first trimester screening, but also for almost everyone, or actually everyone, because we want to build up a surveillance plan. We moved halfway through pregnancy, and our detection rate will go up and our prediction rate for who's going to deteriorate in the next few weeks is going to go up. Can we start aspirin at this time? People love saying no. Yes, I understand that for the treatment in terms of prevention of preeclampsia, it doesn't work well when you start after 16 weeks. But 
When we look at the outcomes like growth restriction, fetal demise and, and preterm deliveries, low-dose aspirin has over several trials in the last two decades shown a 10% increase. It might be modest for you and me, 10% may not mean much, but a simple drug, minimal side effects, great effect, uh, easy to administer under supervision or without supervision, gives you a 10% improvement. You will save one out of 10 of those babies. Isn't that good enough? I think even one out of uh, 100 would be good enough. One out of 10 is fantastic. Of course, again, remember that when you look at the uh, uterine artery, you will use different readings depending on whether you're using a transabdominal scan or a transvaginal scan. And you'll keep saying, well, one side is very much, one side is very little. Of course, if the placenta is localized to that side, the PI will be less, but you're taking a mean and that is what you have to take. The statistics have been worked out that way. So please do not put into the chat box, what do I do for this and what do I do for that? You have to do it in this way and only this way until we come up with something smart. Where do I find this? You find it as a free download on the FMF site and you can actually just put that in. You don't have to pay for this and you can access it at any time. You put in the medical history, you put in the, the mean arterial pressure, the uterine artery PI. And then of course you put in the biochemical measurements. You don't have to calculate the moms. It will calculate it for you. You press calculate and you get the answer and you know what's going to happen. And that is what you do between 19 and 25 weeks. And then you stratify your patients. You find out whether on the basis of this calculation, they're high risk, intermediate, or low risk. And then what do you do next? You say, well, you look at the wonderful work of this trial, which was the prognosis study, which clearly said that you add this, and you have a much better prediction of preeclampsia and you can reduce unnecessarily hospitalization. And they have excellent data that they have presented us. The algorithm that I've been referring to, well, 11 to 13 weeks, high risk, you put them on aspirin. In the low risk, you reassess them at the time of your anomaly scan or in case you're doing your anomaly scan too early, call them back at between 22 and 24 weeks. And at this time, add on your SFLT and PLGF, and then you find out this, if you have the, uh, the FMF calculator, then you follow very simply this law that you do a risk assessment. And if they're low risk, then you just call them back at 36 weeks. And uh, that's how you do it. In case you have actually done the SFLT and PLGF ratio, then you see what it is. If it's low risk, like I said, uh, before 38, then you uh, call them just back at your 36 week scan. If it's intermediate risk, which is 38 to 85, then you reassess them at about 30 or 34 weeks. And if it's high risk, then you start seeing them frequently from 24 weeks onwards. Of course, whenever you have uh, a clinical suspicion, then you can repeat all of this again. So these patients will require clinical screening uh, on a more frequent basis, but most importantly, you can guide yourself either by the FMF calculator or in case uh, your patient has been able to afford the SLT PLGF ratio, then you use uh, the upper uh, rung that I have shown over here. Quite, quite simple. Basically what is gonna happen that low risk and just about everybody will be reseen at 36 weeks. The high risk will be seen uh, um, frequently from 24 weeks onwards. The intermediate first at 30 and then frequently and the low risk, like I said, will just move on. Now, uh, where else does this work? Twin pregnancies? Well, it works. Screening works. And it can work in twin pregnancies. And all you have to do is to use twin specific reference ranges. Uh, what do more can I do? Uh, does FIGO have anything to say? FIGO says, yes, if you're a poor country, you can compromise. But I have a simple thing to ask them. How dare you compromise on a woman just because she can't afford it? We have to say that, look, a compromise is a compromise. You're killing women just because they are poor and no government dare say something like that about the women. It sounds like, a, um, like an election uh, talk, but I must say this, that by accepting the fact that we will not do uterine artery Doppler or that we will not do biochemistry, our detection rate falls and therefore the woman will be exactly where she is. She thinks she's protected, but she's not protected. And therefore we must force governments to say that the first trimester 12 week scan has to be done as a preeclampsia scan and we will give you the advantages of anomalies and Down syndrome as well. 
but this big killer is going to get looked after. The big killer of iatrogenic preterm delivery is going to get looked after. The big killer of FGR is going to get looked after. And therefore, I don't like remarks like this, which say that you're poor and you don't deserve the best. That is not this, uh, the, the dignity that a woman deserves today. We have, yes, a uh, gestosis score. It's now been validated. This is a slightly older slide. And uh, this has actually been developed by the Pune group. It truly helps. But the fact is, we will not allow the government to lean on this and say, you have a choice. No, that's incorrect. The government is not going to be offered a choice. They have to do something for the women of this country. Can we do something else beyond this in case patients missed everything? Yes, two tests. One is Congo Red. And we know that Congo Red bound to misfolded proteins in a watery solution migrates differentially on cellulose membrane, forming dying patterns uh, compared with the free Congo Red solution. And because the urine of these women is going to be different, we'll say, all right, we must make sure that we have to actually add that. And then you get a pattern like this. It's something that can be done in the OPD, inexpensive, uh, likely to become available in the very near future, and you can do it. The, hopefully, this will be available on a more regular basis. We have something else. Maternal glycosylated fibronectin, and I'll just take a minute more. This is something new. We realize that women at risk for immediate preeclampsia in the next few days, apart from that SFL TPL GF ratio, will also show an elevated glycosylated fibronectin in their blood. And so a test has been developed since 2015, which says that yes, you, you take a finger prick sample and you get the results in 10 minutes. You have to take it into prepared, put it into this little ready-made kit and you get the answer and you have an answer as normal, abnormal, positive, or high positive, and it tells you exactly to do with this. No nomograms, but just a value and the interpretation and what to do all the way up to 37 weeks. A great bedside test for making sure uh, that you can offer this as a service. A little expensive at the moment, but we hope that with numbers, we'll be able to pull this down. What's new? We have ophthalmic artery Doppler and the technique is well defined and it can be used excellently at the 36 week scan. You put the transducer on the mother's eyelid and you get these answers. You get, a, uh, you get two peaks um, in, in, in that wave and you take a ratio of the first and the second, not the PI, the ratio of the second uh, PSV to the first PSV. And depending on what you see, you take two readings from each eye and you get a 100% answer on the risk that she has. So this is really, the best biomarker that we've come across. And again, thanks to Kipros Nicolaidis for this particular thing. He's been suggesting it at 36 weeks, and now we've been trying it at the 19, 20 week window, and it works equally well. Anything else, maternal cardiac function, still under development, a little tricky in terms of use, but I think we should be able to use it in the near future. For now, screen for preeclampsia, follow it up, and make sure that no woman remains deprived of this. Thank you so much, and my apologies for exceeding by a minute. We, of course, will have questions on all of this um, at the end uh, of our session today. And I now hand this over to our uh, next uh, session experts, uh, a CPAM case presented by Yogesh Chaudhary, and expert comments from our SFM president, Dr. Tialan Praveen. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, Ashok. And uh, I invite uh, Yogesh to share his screen and present the case? Yes, sir. Is it fine from my side, sir? Uh, your voice is a little low. I mean, can you? Yeah, that I will try. Okay. Uh, thank you, Purana, sir, and Chinmay, sir, uh, for that wonderful first session. Uh, good evening to all my respected teachers and all uh, attendees. Uh, and thank you, SFM, for giving me such a great opportunity to present my case. Uh, now, CPAM is uh, one uh, condition I feel that the expectant management works very well because 80 to 90 percent, uh, they uh, if they have isolated and smaller in size, they have got a very good prognosis. So just a family reassurance and proper follow-up uh, is very important in such cases. So I will just start my case. Uh, 
the patient was a 29 year old primary uh, there was a single tone pregnancy and that was a natural conception there was no significant past history and the first trimester screening was normal and uh, her 19 week scan anomaly scan showed a well defined echogenic triangular lesion in the uh, left lung in lower third and actually this case was already diagnosed by our colleague dr smita brute ma'am and uh, the patient was referred by the clinician for second opinion now what i found that most common section four chamber u in which we uh, look for the lung abnormalities there was a well defined triangular lesion homogeneously echogenic in the left lung in the lower third uh, when we look at the cardiac position very carefully what we found that there was a slight mediastinal shift on the right but uh, other uh, lung was normal and the heart was normal and it was a isolated finding in this fetus so we decided uh, to scan the fetus uh, in detail so this is the video taken by convex probe uh, with coronal and the axial plane so what we can see uh, here is the diaphragm is intact the lesion is very well defined and homogeneously echogenic here you can see the intact diaphragm so just to confirm it again i go for the 9a linear probe to get the better anatomical location of the abnormality so what we can see here is the very well defined diaphragm so we rule out the diaphragmatic hernias as well as we define the differentiating line between the normal and abnormal lung as well as i look for the uh, any cystic lesion and the bronchial dilatation which was not there in this case then my next uh, important uh, work is to look for the vascular supply because i want to differentiate between cpam and the sequestration but to my surprise what i found is this look at this video very carefully so what we can see here is i surely see one uh, artery which is supplying to the lesion which is arising from the aorta but in addition to that there is a paired vessel pulmonary artery and vein which was draining into the normal pulmonary circulation so there was a dual vascular supply here to this lesion which i confirm on the pulse doppler also this was a systemic vessel which was arising from the aorta and supplying to the lesion and this was the paired pulmonary artery and pulmonary vein classical waveform which was draining uh, also to this lesion so it was a uh, having dual uh, vascular supply now to quantify the abnormality uh, we have uh, this uh, we uh, used cvr that is cpam volume ratio we take a length breadth and height of the lesion we put into the calculator length height width into 0.5 and which is divided by head circum this is just to uh, be a standardization of the abnormality by visual impression we can judge whether it is mild small moderate but for follow up purposes this C cvr ratio is uh, very important if you go to the perinatology.com site we just have to put the uh, measurements and you get the cvr ratio automatically now at the anomaly scan what our impression was it was a hybrid lesion in view of dual supply uh, vascular supply there were no cystic lesions no bronchial dilatation other lung rest of the lung was normal no associated anomaly and cvr was less than 0.5 so it was having a good prognostic value in future so we just uh, consult the family and we decided to follow the patient and obviously we uh, look uh, we ruled out the differentials like sequestration cle and uh, segmental bronchial obstruction now patient came at the 24 weeks for follow up scan now what we can see the lesion is there the lung appeared slightly bulky and lesion appeared slightly enlarged what here we can see that the lesion is looking larger and there is obviously a significant mediastinal shift but rest of the lung was normal there was no changes of any hydrops or any cardiac compromise so uh, usually uh, such lesions their size is at the peak and largest at around 24 to 26 weeks but uh, 
still we uh, reassured the patient and just asked them to be patient and continue the pregnancy. The other findings were same. There was a pulmonary supply as well as systemic pressure. So size slightly increased, though CVR, CVR remained less than one. There was mild mediastinal shift, but there were no any fresh abnormalities. So we asked them to just follow them, uh, follow her at 32 weeks. She, she came uh, at the 32 weeks and look at this. This is the four chamber view. Uh, transaxial section to the thorax, there was no mediastinal shift and both lungs were almost looking normal and the lesion we saw at 24 weeks was almost uh, not very easily appreciable. When I took the coronal section, the small ecogenic area was there at the base of the lung and see the complete lung was homogeneous, no cystic changes and the lesion become very small and very subtle. So we assume that it is resolving and becoming smaller. So at 32 weeks, lesion became smaller uh, and there was no demarcation between normal and abnormal. So uh, it got merged with the normal lung and obviously no, uh, there were no changes of fetal hydrops or mirror syndrome. Mirror syndrome, which they have described like the fetal hydrope get reflected into the maternal circulation. That means it is a triple edema, that fetal edema, placental edema, and maternal edema. So all these signs were uh, not there. There was no mediastinal shift. Growth parameters were normal. Doppler was normal. So we just asked them to uh, follow routine obstetric management protocols and uh, follow the baby after birth. Now perinatal. Uh, patient went to the home time, hometown and she delivered there. Normal vaginal delivery was conducted. For one month, we followed the baby. Baby was absolutely normal, clinically uh, settled, no respiratory symptom. And thanks to Dr. Sangeeta Gore, she is radiologist at Ambe Zogai. Uh, she done the x-ray of that baby and x -ray, on x-ray, the lung fields were absolutely normal. This was the mediastinal shadow, which is slightly deviated because of the rotation, but the lung fields were normal. So we are now just uh, following the feet, uh, that baby and ask them to follow up uh, with the pediatrician regularly uh, for the lung lesion if it is there. Now, in short, uh, sir will be discussing all the details, but I just uh, uh, briefly uh, uh, tell some uh, few things about the CPAM. These are actually histopathologically areas of abnormal proliferation of terminal bronchioles. Obviously, the, there, there are no normal alveoli. Histopathologically, there are few types, but radiologically, only two types, solid or cystic. Uh, Sometimes histo histopathologically, uh, many lesions are mixed type, like sequestration plus CPAM, CPAM plus terminal bronchial atresia, ETC and significant prognostic factor are uh, only the size of lesion and the, whether cysts are present or not and if the uh, baby develops hydrops or not. That is the only crucial things we need to observe. And as association with chromosomal anomalies in such cases, especially when isolated are very low. So we don't have to do much about with respect to genetic evaluation. And definitely uh, these differentiation, uh, differential diagnosis, we, I ruled out were sequestration. Obviously there was a mixed type of lesion, uh, CPAM cystic or microcystic type. And we need to differentiate uh, these lesions from the congenital diaphragmatic hernias. When there is a dilated bowel in the chest, it is easy, but when there is a non-dilated bowel or uh, liver herniation, like here in this image, it becomes a little bit tricky to differentiate uh, these CPAMs from the uh, congenital hernias, but use of pro proper use of machine, use of Doppler to look for the vascular supply and integrity of diaphragm. These finding, if we look carefully, then uh, things become easy uh, to uh, uh, finalize the diagnosis. And key points, I feel that correct diagnosis with systematic approach at right time is important. Use, try to use high frequency probe, linear or volume probe. Pro uh, as far as prognostication is concerned, try to calculate the CPAM volume ratio and look for the presence and absence of cyst. Family reassurance is the very key factor because uh, relatives get panicked and they need to uh, reassure that the most of the time the prognosis is good. 
so regular follow up and uh, to look for the hydrops is very important and i feel that expectant management with uh, patients always work in cases of cpam thank you very much uh hello thank you yes, i stop sharing thank my screen yeah, please, please. yeah thank you so yeah. much uh thank you yogesh it was a wonderful presentation and uh, i think you have covered uh, all the aspects of uh, cpan and what are what are expected and what is it that we have to go about and what is uh, what is required as far as the follow up is and management of these cases are concerned now uh, let me share my screen and i'll take you through the uh, one second one second, one second sorry thank you and sorry for the delay and then uh, hope you are now seeing my screen as well as uh, my pointer here now uh, basically the congenital lung lesions are actually labeled as of, as of now as congenital lung malformations and what are we going to do with the ultrasound and is what is is most important thing now we all know that the con congenital lung malformations are not very common and are quite easily diagnosed and ultrasound is the primary imaging tool which we quite often use in identifying these lesions and it's a simple axial of the transverse thoracic thorax is the at the level of the four chamber view four chambers is the ideal section to evaluate lung lesions most of the, these lung lesions as it has been clearly demonstrated by yogesh that they quite often regress spontaneously and there are robust prognosticators predicting neonatal outcome so these are the things that we have to have a basic concept about it now the, these are the various congenital uh, lung malformations that we come across and all of them the yogesh has covered so i am not going to take you through these things now where does ultrasound fit in that's what exactly is what we are going to discuss today now first and foremost thing it is to identify our, uh, the lesion as well as uh, as far as possible give a differential diagnosis and try to diagnose the lesion and then understand the natural course of the lesion is extremely important because that is what is going to help us in counseling these patients and plan planning the postnatal outcomes prognosticating this uh, the outcome is very very important because ultrasound plays an extremely important role in prognosticating these lesions and this prognostication and understanding the natural course of the lesion will help us planning the management strategies both pre postnatal management time and mode of mode and place of delivery as well as preparing the neonatologist as well as the pediatric surgeon it also helps us in counseling these parents so keeping this in mind it is obvious that ultrasound is the imaging modality in evaluating these congenital lung malformations as it has been very clearly demonstrated by yogesh in his talk regarding the identifying or assessing the thoracic lesions i am not going to take you through basically what we need to understand is that the lung echogenicity is slightly brighter than the echogenicity of the liver or the spleen that is one thing which helps us in identifying the diaphragmatic contour and this is one thing which we have to keep in mind and as well as the mediastinal shift is one thing which we have to keep in mind in assessing these uh, uh, lesions either you draw a midline a vertical line from the sternum to the the the, the uh, vertebral body Uh, two thirds of it is on to the left, and one third is on to the right. That is the heart, and the rest all that is more than the seventy percent of the thorax is occupied by the lung. These volumes can be calculated, and uh, you can use a, a, a conventional uh, equation to assess the volume, or you can do a three D rendering to assess the volumes. Now I'll just take you through uh, various lesions. That is the congenital pulmonary airway uh, malformations, the CPAM. where you can have a macro cystic like this which is a large cyst with echogenic lung or you can have absolutely echogenic lungs which are because of the micro cystic lesions there can be some sometimes a mix of type of lesions and as as it has been stated stalker is the one who has described the histopathological lesions which are of the five types but quite often in our practice as it has been said either a cystic or a solid lesion is solid looking lesion is what we are going to identify then coming to this uh, pulmonary sequestration we have the bronchopulmonary four gut abnormality 
and it is quite often or sometimes it is associated with the CPAM and both the pulmonary sequestration as well as the CPAM are, do not communicate with the bronchial tree as well as the CPAM or the uh, sequestrated lung will have an independent systemic blood supply from the, the, the uh, iota which, which differentiates it from the uh, pinyin cystic adenomatoid malformation and sequestrated lung can be intralobar or extralobar. Now, this is the classical example of an intra-robar uh, uh, lesion where you put the color doctor on and you can see that there is a systemic uh, blood supply. Quite often, the one most important thing that we need to understand is you need to de demonstrate this sort of a supply in both the axial as well as the sagittal sections or a coronal section in order to specify saying that this particular vessel which is approaching the lesion is from the uh, iota, that is the systemic supply. Not only that, as Yogesh has demonstrated, taking a spectral waveform will confirm that this is a branch arising from the abdominal iota. Now, here is a, an, another case of um, a hybrid lesion where you have a cystic adenomatoid malformation as well as a echogenic area, which is because of the sequestration. This is a combination of both cystic adenomatoid malformation as well as the uh, um, bron bron bronchopulmonary sequestration. So this lady again came back at about 23 weeks of gestation where we could demonstrate that there are cystic components as well as there is an echogenic the triangular echogenic area which was being supplied by the, the branch arising from the aorta. When at 32 weeks, there was a spontaneous regression of the, uh, the CPAM, but there was a persistence of this uh, pulmonary sequestration. So this is how a, a regression can take place, spontaneous regression can happen. Now, the other echogenic lung lesions or the congenital lobe, uh, lung malformations are the shavos, where we have congenital high airway obstruction, where will, there will be a symmetry, markedly enlarged echogenic lungs. Quite often, the diaphragms are flat or inverted. There will be a small heart, no mediastinal shape. Quite often, what we have is the mesocardia, and there can be associated hydrops, ascites, as well as polyhydramnias. Now, the other situation is the bronchial atresia. Quite often, what we, this is a rare common, a rare lesion that we come across. What we have is a segmental echogenic triangular shadow. It becomes very difficult to differentiate on a grayscale imaging to whether it is a sequestrated lung or a bronchial atresia. But once you put the color doctor on, you know that there is no systemic blood supply. And that's the reason why. And not only that, you can feel, uh, find the bronchial, proximal bronchus, which is filled with fluid, which indicates that there is a bronchial atresia. So this is how you diagnose a bronchial atresia. Now, one more important factor, which we have to always keep in mind is what is called as the congenital lobar overinflation. This congenital lobar overinflation is one thing which I would like to spend a little more time because it is quite often very easily missed on antenatal or prenatal ultrasound examination. What we have is an overinflated hyperepigenic lung, which is causing mass effect on the adjacent structures. At the same time, it is very difficult to differentiate between the other echogenic lung lesions. And on, on, uh, quite often it can be even associated with bronchial atresia, wherein again you find a segmental involvement where there is an echogenic uh, triangular segment which, is, uh, uh, which can be identified. But most important thing that we need to understand is this is basically because of poor development of the bronchial cartilage and this leads to collapse of the bronchus and that collapse of the bronchus functions as a one-way valve so that the amniotic fluid gets accumulated in the alveoli they become echogenic, they become larger, and there will be mediastinal shift. And then this sort of a features can also be seen in other things. As I said, it is quite often very, very subtle, and that's the reason why prenatal ultrasound may not be able to diagnose. And most important thing is, whenever we find this sort of a congenital lobar overinflation, please remember there is a higher incidence of postnatal uh, respiratory pathologies or problems than, uh, than all other congenital lung malformations. Now, this is the CT. This is the, this patient, we diagnosed it actually as a, as a cystic adenomatoid malformation. And later on, in, in the postnatal period, they did a CT, which showed that there was a hyperinflated a lobar emphysema, which is another name for congenital lobar overinflation, where you can see the vascularity seen on either sides of the lesion. Now, what are, what, is, what are all the postnatal outcome or the natural course of these lesions? First and foremost thing, prenatal regression of congenital lung malformations is known. But remember, 
even though there is a prenatal regression, it does not rule out respiratory complications after birth. This is one important factor that we have to keep in mind while we are counseling these patients. That is one. Second is 40% of the CPAMs are diagnosed after birth. And it also helps us in identifying or in, in, uh, in categorizing them the length of uh, in, uh, initial hospital stay. And quite often, you can also prognosticate stating that they need post, postnatally respiratory support within 24 hours after birth. The respiratory support can be in the form of low flow supplemental oxygen or a humidified high flow nasal cannula or a continuous positive wave pressure, non-invasive positive pressure ventilation or a mechanical ventilation. So all these sort of respiratory support may be required within 24 hours after birth. That is one. Two, there has been a, uh, uh, a, a follow-up for about two years where the surgery within two years after birth is also one of them which we have to keep in mind. And uh, quite often, we may have to embolize the aberrant artery which is supplying the bronchopulmonary sequestration. So this is the natural outcome or the postnatal outcome which we have to expect whenever we see a congenital lung malformation. Now, with this, let us try to understand what are the various prognosticating factors which we can come across and which can help us in identifying these lesions and prognosticating them. One, gestational age at which the lesion was detected. That is one most important thing. And that tells us the progression of the lesion. Then the size of the thorax is again important finding. And then the location of the lesion, the type of the congenital lung, lung malformation, whether there is a mediastinal shift or not, presence of polyhydramnias and any intervention that has been attempted like whenever you have a macrocystic uh, type of cystic as adenomatoid malformation, we try to aspirate in order to prevent high drops or whenever there is a polyhydramnias in order to do an amnio reduction, you may have to aspirate the amniotic fluid and presence or absence of associated abnormalities. I have specifically not uh, avoided mentioning the word high drops because I will take you through the high drops. Now, development of high drops is again an important factor. This can be very well made out by using what is called as the CVR, that is the CPAM volume ratio, which is calculated by uh, the formula which has been designed by Tromlham uh, et al. And this has to be done at three stages. This is a very, very important thing that we have to remember now. And this is, a, uh, this is the latest uh, information that has been provided in evaluating or prognosticating these fetuses, wherein you need to take the CVR once at about 18 to 24 weeks, then about 25 to 29 weeks, and then 30 to 36 weeks. You call it as US1, US2, US3. Now, whenever the CVR is more than 1.6, as we all know, 80% of them possibly develop high drops. That is most important thing, which we are already aware of. The next important thing is, whenever the CVR is more than 0 0.39 at the second examination, that is between 25 to 29 weeks of gestation, it predicts need for postnatal respiratory support within 24 hours after birth. This is an important thing that we have to keep in mind. The third one is whenever the CVR is more than 0.64, in the first examination that is between 18 to 24 or when it is more than 0 0.80 at US3 that is between 30 to 36. These are the patients with a loss associated with it if there is a persistence of a media center shift, they need surgery within two years after birth. So this is what has been postulated in this public, uh, publication which has been published recently in the White Journal. Now, how do we calculate the CVR? Actually, Dr. Yogesh has very clearly demonstrated to us where we take the D1, D2, D3, uh, multiply with, this is the volume calculation and divided by HC, that is the head circumference, which gives us the CVR. If it is more than, less than 1.6, the risk of high drops is less than 3%. If it is more than that, it's almost 75 to 80%. And another important thing is, whenever there is a large cyst, it is always essential that you may have to do a thoracoamniotic shunt or a, a, not a thoracoamniotic, cystoamniotic shunt. And this can be predicted by doing a CVR, where if the CVR is more than 1.2, but less than 1.6, these are the fetuses which can be attempted to do a, a, whenever there is a large cyst in the lung to do a, what is called as the cystoamniotic shunt. Now, coming to the prenatal uh, prognosticators, the second important factor other than the CVS is the size of the lesion. 
The size of the lesion can be in the natural course that it can be stable compared to fetal growth. That is, the fetal growth is correspondingly, um, the, size, the size of the lesion is, remains stable in spite of the growth of the fetus or stable in absolute size. It can decrease in size, both in the absolute size as well as independent of the fetal growth, or it can increase in size as we have seen in Yogesh case in the, in, the, in the second scan, that is almost the US2, and then the visible but not measurable, that is what has happened in the third scan of uh, Yogesh where it was done at 32 weeks, where it was visible but it was not able, we were not able to measure that one, or sometimes it can become non-visible. So the size of the lesion also plays an important role associated with it. We need to keep in mind the mediastinal shift. Now, putting all these things into a structured ultrasound report is what is essential for evaluating the congenital lung malformations. This is a classical uh, 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 report format that has been designed where all the factors which I have mentioned are put in and then the, it, is, it is just measured and then put into this uh, format, you get the answer. So this is how we are going to go about. So the key, key learning points are that the congenital lung malformations are not common. They have typical diagnostic ultrasound features. CPAM are classified as macro, micro and maxi type. Uh, bronchopulmonary sequestration is diagnosed by demonstrating systemic arterial blood supply from the iota. Uh, ultrasound prognostic factors are extremely useful in de determining the postnatal outcome. Monitoring the, these, these lesions between 18 to 24, 25 to 29, and 30 to 35 gestational weeks is required, and based on which the parent counseling can be done and mode and place of delivery can be planned as they may require respiratory support within 24 hours or after 24 hours after birth or may require surgery within two years after birth. Another most important thing which we have to keep in mind, whenever we have a, a fetus, which has been, I mean, fetus with congenital low bar malformation, really when the, the baby is delivered and the infant definitely need a postnatal CT and a follow-up for at least two years. So with this, I think these are the key points which I wanted to put forward as far as the congenital lung malformations, basically focusing on not the features, but on prognostication and how are we going to go about managing these patients and counseling them. Thank you very, very much. Hello? Yeah, I think... I think we can ask uh, Santosh now to take over. Yeah. Santosh, can you take over? And, uh... Hello. Shall I share my screen now? Yes, yes. Uh, good evening all uh, after those fabulous two cases and uh, fantastic discussion we'll move to the third case uh, it's a very common occurrence in day-to-day -day practice to uh, see a ventriculomegaly and i'll be presenting a small case regarding that and then dr shah will uh, tell us more about it so this was a 22 year old primary gravida she had come for a routine ultrasound at around 28 weeks unfortunately she had missed an anomalous scan and uh, otherwise there was no significant family history and personal history associated. The first and foremost thing that uh, struck me at the actual section was uh, that the posterior horn of the fetal left lateral ventricle was dilated and it, had, it was showing clear contents. The measurement was around 15 mm posteriorly and the frontal horn was also prominent. It measured 5 mm. The ventricular margins were smooth and regular. The choroid plexus appeared normal. There was no periventricular ecogenicity, edema or any other pathology. The right ventral ventricle was collapsed and not dilated. And there was present a small uh, subcalosal cyst that was uh, the midline cavum uh, at the level of the in the midline at the cavum level, which was the large cavum septum pellucidum and the posterior cavum vergi. The posterior fossa cerebellum was normal. The corpus callosum was uh, normally seen. The third and fourth ventricles were not dilated. The visualized cerebral cortex appeared normal and symmetrical and normal sulcation for the age was noted at this stage. 
the subarachnoid space was also normal. So we decided to do an extended neurosonogram by taking coronal as well as sagittal sections. So these are the coronal sweep, which is showing the similar findings, dilated unilateral monoventricle. Otherwise, the rest of the brain parenchyma was normal. Same with the sagittal sweeps. You can see a dilated clear fluid filled ventricle. The choroid plexus is normal. So is the posterior fossa and rest of the brain parenchyma. These are the still images showing the same pathologies. The extended neurosonogram with four coronal sections and the three sagittal sections. The fetal face was normal, normal orbits, nasal bone, uh, lips and mouth was seen. Associated finding in the patient was that of uh, dilated renal pelvic elastial system and the ureter. The ureter showed mild to moderate dilatation and the renal pelvis moderate dilatation on both the sides. So based on this, uh, the findings were there was isolated monoventriculomegaly. There was no associated brain findings. Bilateral renal pelvic elastial and ureteric dilatation was noted. We advised the patient MRI, torch panel and genetic testing. Unfortunately, the patient did not heed to us and was lost to follow. She came after a period of six weeks without doing any other investigations. And follow up uh, ultrasound after six weeks revealed that there is some regression in the uh, dilatation of the ventricle, but it was still present. Rest of the brain parenchyma has progressed nicely and normal sulcation was also noted in this condition. The patient went to for a native for a delivery and was lost to follow up as happens in most of these cases. So uh, I think a monoventriculomegaly is an important uh, day to day occurrence and uh, we'll be talking about the diagnosis, its significance, associations, genetics and for the uh, management and counseling. So thanks a lot for this. I hand over the mic now to Dr. Mohit Shah, who will elucidate about these features further. Thank you, Santosh. Your images were exquisite. Beautiful images. The extended neurosonogram was wonderful. And uh, you indeed presented a rarer case of unilateral ventricular megaly. So I wish we could have had the follow-up because there was so much to uh, learn. Uh, eventually, even with an MR, maybe a post nasal MR could have probably thrown more light onto it. But in which way we are going to approach a case of fetal ventricular megaly? Now it is quite common, almost seen in almost 1.5 percent of the fetal at the mid gestation. But you got to understand that it is more of a finding which actually signals to a possibility of associated CNS anomalies or we, it sort of prompts you to look at the comprehensive structural evaluation of the fetus. We know that ventricular megaly, isolated or apparently isolated, is associated with chromosomal abnormalities, typically trisomy 21, and is also seen in fetal infections, and it has a male preponderance of 1.7 is to 1. Now, by definition, Ventricular megaly is defined as an axial diameter at the level of the atrium, which is more than 10 millimeter from the second trimester onwards. Normally, it hovers around 7.6. It rarely is seen extending beyond 7.6, uh, almost up to the term gestation. And if you have a 10 millimeter as a cutoff, remember that this is three standard deviations above mean. The other ancillary uh, objective criteria is when you measure the medial wall of the, uh, the, the medial, uh, the distance from the, um, the ventricular wall to the medial end of the choroid plexus. If this is more than three millimeters, then you know that the ventricles are dilated and the choroid plexus are dangling there. Though this is not uncommon, we, mm -hmm. this often 
overdiagnosed. And one of the main reasons why it is overdiagnosed is because it is not technically measured in the right sense, the right place and with the right caliper settings. And therefore, there's a very nice article in the ISOOG where you have a standardization as to how you need to measure the lateral ventricles. So the head has to be in a perfect axial plane. The image is magnified so that the head occupies almost the majority of the monitor. The focal zone is kept just below the contralateral, um, I mean, the uh, far end of the lateral, uh, lateral ventricle. And you ensure that the parieto-occipital fissure and the occipital horn are very clearly imaged. Once you have done that, then you measure uh, the lateral ventricle at the level of the parieto-occipital fissure with an inner-to-inner -inner measurement. You have to ensure that you place the caliper on the inner-to-inner -inner across the glomus of the la la lateral ventricle there. Now you got to understand that you see the further, the far away lateral ventricle much more easily. But when you find that there is one ventricle which is dilated, you have to ensure that you see the near ventricle as well. Now this can get difficult to visualize and you need to go in an oblique actual planes at times to try and visualize the near ventricle as well. But when you find uh, one ventricle which is dilated, do ensure that you also look at the other near end ventricle uh, to see whether that one is normal or if there's asymmetry in the ventricular sizes. Now, we've also been able to diagnose ventricular megaly in the first trimester. Now, remember, when we talk of uh, the normal anatomy in the first trimester, we know that the choroid plexus occupy most of the supratentorium at this point in time. And that's what gives us the typical butterfly sign where it completely fills up the lateral ventricles. You seldom see fluid within the lateral ventricles. But if you have a ventricular megaly, it will manifest as a small choroid plexus which is dangling freely. And the borders of the choroid plexus do not touch the medial and lateral wands of the ventricle. Of course, you have a very nice paper by Gwandaline where we actually objectively uh, categorize as to how you can uh, objectively say that there is a fetal ventricular megaly uh, in the first trimester by measuring the choloid plexus length to the lateral ventricular length or the area to the ventricular area or the diameter to the lateral ventricular diameter. Do um, remember that the first thing that you should exclude in the first trimester is an open neural tube defect. So whenever you see a small choroid plexus or a dilated ventricle, you uh, make sure that you've excluded an open neural tube defect and you can use this objective criteria. The etiology, well, we know most of them. Most of them are associated with obstructive features of the so CNS anomalies like a Dendimocker continuum, cherry malformations, aqueductal stenosis, some the agenesis of corpus callosum causes the typical um, occipital horn dilatation and infections, toxos, EMV, and Zika. And it is known to be associated with aneuploidies. But more than that, it can be seen in many, many syndromes and different skeletal dysplasias. You can just Google it and you'll find a list of syndromes and skeletal dysplasias that are associated with it. Basically, it is graded into three grades, mild, moderate, and severe. So when we talk of mild ventricular megaly, we are talking of an atrial diameter, which is between 10 and 12. Moderate is between 12 and 15. And uh, severe is when you are talking of an diameter, which is more than 15. And this is often said to be associated with an obstructive feature. Those are the obstructive anomalies. So whenever you find a ventricular megaly, the next thing that you need to do, as Dr. Santosh has so well done, is perform the extended neurogram. We are well versed with the three basic views of CNS uh, in the action that's transthalamic, ventricular, and cerebellar, but you need to go forward and take four coronal views, that's the transfrontal, transcordate, transthalamic, and transcerebellar, and three sagittal views, the midline sagittal, and the two parasite sagittal views that will actually show you the better anatomy. 
so the midline sagittal view is must to exclude midline and posterior fossa abnormalities so ensure that you take a proper mid statue where we can see the corpus callosum as well as the vermis in one go and the parasagittal view is a fantastic view to look at the actual morphology of the lateral ventricle this so this tells this shows you in fact the complete lateral ventricle the borders are very well seen so you can find out whether the margin is regular what is the periventricular area looking like is the cerebral cortex smooth is the sulcations well seen is the subarachnoid space widened <clears throat> how does the fluid within the lateral ventricle look is it clear is it turgid is it septated so the parasag view gives you a fantastic view to look at the morphology of the lateral ventricles and coupled with the coronal planes <clears throat> is a must to a completely evaluate <clears throat> the cns so when you talk of uh, a complete comprehensive evaluation of any anatomical structure you need to have a checklist the one same checklist that we use for normal anomaly scans when we use <clears throat> it for a comprehensive extended neurosonogram it's always good to start with the biometry the calcarium the shape the lateral ventricles to look at the size the choroid plexus size and echo pattern look at the contents of the lateral ventricle whether it is clear do you see uh, septations clots look at the third and the fourth ventricles the presence of csp which is an indirect surrogate marker for the presence of corpus callosum look at the volume of the two cerebral hemispheres are they symmetrical or is it one enlarged one small uh, are the sort of subarachnoid space too widened or they are not or they are completely effaced look at the parenchyma and end with the posterior fossa very often mm -hmm. the question that needs to be asked is is mri necessary when well, it does complement ultrasound and it does show the sulci and gyra in much better fashion but the only thing that you need to remember is if you need to do an mri you need to do it after 26 weeks because that's when the sulcations and gyrations are formed and this is particularly useful in isolated ventricular megaly because different studies have shown that you could possibly get almost 16 to 24% additional findings than ultrasound but it all boils down to the competence of an operator i mean you feel uh, you know if you have done a comprehensive you know a systematic neurosonogram an extended view with a good machine and good resolution probably mr can still maybe may additionally show few, few features which are probably come up later but i believe that mr should be done typically after 26 weeks to just as a complement for an ultrasound to pick up any additional feature that might develop later which may not have been apparent at 20 weeks and therefore it will be a fantastic complementary uh, modality so when we want to assess the etiology all you need to do is find out if there is any change in morphology of the lateral ventricle so when you look at the lateral ventricle you should be looking it in the terms of size shape is it uh, are there septae or echogenic contents within it how are the walls are they echogenic are they nodular and how does the periventricular space look like is it clear halo or do you see an echogenic halo do you see calcifications around it uh, this will actually lead to an uh, exact etiology for example if you see a teardrop Uh, lateral ventricle now that's a hallmark of a complete agenesis of corpus callosum uh, if you see a pointed occipital horn you see normally it's rounded but if you see a pointed occipital horn that's usually seen in a neural tube defect <clears throat> if you see periventricular echogenicity intraventricular septations these are classical hallmarks of fetus infections and as Uh, the infections in evolve or the, it progress the anomalies in the cns might also progress so you can have periventricular and parenchymal calcifications you can have subependymal cyst abnormal gyrations and an infection can disrupt normal anatomy typically the corpus callosum 
also. And eventually they cause microcephaly, thereby increasing the pericerebral subarachnoid space. So all in all, once you find uh, one finding, it can lead to the other. Knowing uh, what is normal will probably tell you, make and sort of, sort of highlight an abnormality quite well. So if you have a increased echogenicity of the lateral ventricle and but the choroid plexus appears heterogeneous, you got to think of an intraventricular hemorrhage. If you find that the walls of the choroid plexus are irregular, or you find that there's subtle nodularity at the margins of the uh, lateral ventricles, you got to think of neuronal migration disorders. The choroid plexus cyst will involve the choroid plexus, the substance of the choroid plexus, so will a uh, papilloma or any mass which is arising from the choroid. Look at the uh, CSP. If you do not see the cavum septum, you're talking of a, a agenesis of corpus callosum. Of course, you do remember that when I say an absent CSP, um, you're talking of an axial view, but you need to you know, complement uh, this with the sagittal view to say that indeed the corpus callosum is absent. If you see a short or a wide CSP and you do a sag view, you should expect a partial agenesis of the corpus callosum. And you look at the ventricles there, they do appear prominent. In fact, the study by Lee et al. in the wide journal revealed that almost, um, you know, 13% of the patients referred for ventricular megaly had callosal abnormalities. And out of that, almost 66% had associated CNS or aneuploidy or other major abnormalities. But most importantly, five feti diagnosed prenatally as having only isolated callosal abnormality had CNS findings on postnatal assessment. And this is the tricky question there as to how do you counsel these patients. If you see an absence CSV with fused horns, fused frontal horns, you got to think of you know, minor forms of holopresent cephaly, septo-optic dysplasias, uh, she's in cephalies, isolated agenesis of septum pellicidum. So you look at the midline fissure there, you look at the fox, you, you see the fox there, you, and you see the optic chiasm, uh, well, uh, you're just talking of an isolated septal agenesis, but if you don't see the optic chiasm, you're talking of an SOD. And if you don't see the fox there, you're talking of a, uh, holop lobar holoprosen carefully. So you look also at the infratentorial compartment because we know that a lot of uh, abnormalities in the infratentorial compartment leads to hydrocephalus, more often an hydro obstructive hydrocephalus. So you look at the cerebellum, you look at the cisterna magna, fourth ventricle, is a vermis seen in toto, is a morphology, and um, the location of the vermis normal because we know that open neural tube defects can cause uh, the posterior dislocation of the cerebellum and the effacement of the cisterna magna and as a result in hydrocephalus. And we know that uh, the common, uh, you know, dandy walker malformations can also lead to obstructive hydrocephalus. You could have arachnoid cyst in the posterior fossa, which can lead to obstructive hydrocephalus. When you subarachnoid space is something that strikes out, you don't really look for it. It stands out as an increased space between the brain and the overlying calvarium. So this is increased when you have cerebral atrophy and cerebral atrophy is usually seen post-infection. And, uh, and if you do not see the subarachnoid space, if it is getting compressed, that means there is increased pressure within the cranium, and this is usually seen as an obstructive hydrocephalus. <clears throat> so look at the parenchyma, an abnormal thinning can be a uh, <coughs> secondary to obstructive hydrocephalus lesions, but also look at destructive cerebral lesions, which tend to communicate with the ventricles, thereby enlarging the ventricles like porencephaly, she's in cephaly, and sometimes hydrinencephaly is just seen as one fluid filled cavity completely occupying the cerebral parenchyma. Do look for sulcations. As a matter of habit, you know, try documenting the sylvan fissure in all your anomaly scans. So therefore, you know 
<clears throat> how does a sylvan fisher look at 20 weeks and follow it up when you do subsequent scans so you know that how the operculation takes place and how the shape changes for the sylvan fisher so if you have delayed sulcations, you're talking of lesencephaly, premature sulcations is polymicrogyagia. Obstructive hydrocephalus very often is aqueductal stenosis. It leads to severe obstructive dilatation of the lateral ventricles and the third ventricle, resulting in parenchymal thinning. And you can see that the choroids dangle and sometimes the choroid from the other side uh, seep into the uh, um, lateral ventricle of the opposite side because there's a disruption of FARCs due to increased pressure. Do remember that even after a complete comprehensive um, neuro extended neurosurgogram, you're expected to look at the fetus in total as a whole and try and pick up any additional markers or anomalies in the entire uh, survey of the fetus. Now, uh, unilateral ventricular medley is what Dr. Santosh has just shown us. Now, uh, unilateral ventricle is not very rare. Generally, it is associated with partial agenesis of corpus callosum or is seen in cases of infections. Asymmetric ventricular medley is a different term altogether where both ventricles are dilated, but one is slightly more dilated than the other. And the difference has to be more than two millimeter. And his paper by Basile in the American Journal of Neuroradiology is found that the symmetric ventricular megalies generally are associated with more CNS abnormalities, whereas asymmetric generally have worse outcomes because they are usually post infective or post ischemic. And therefore, be mindful that when you measure the ventricles, you're measuring them correctly. So an apparently isolated mild ventricular megaly. Now, apparently is a very strong word that we're using here because we don't know for sure whether this is the only abnormality we are seeing at this point in time. Because when we're doing it at a 20-week scan, the sulcation gyrations are not completed and we don't know what might eventually turn up. But if you, it is quite often, if it is just that finding at that point in time, it is quite often insignificant, but we need to understand that because it is associated with aneuploidy and fetal infections, further testing is mandatory, okay? It can be associated with other abnormalities that may be seen after birth. And this is the major catch there that we need to remember. It has got a very strong association with Down's the positive likelihood ratio of a ventricular megaly is 3.81, is almost as similar as that of an increased nuchal fold. So should prenatal testing be offered? Yes, because we know that it has got a, a higher incidence or an association with trisomy 21. And therefore, we should ideally be talking of a chromosomal microarray or at least a clinical exome. And, um, uh, you know, when you have a recurrent ventricular megaly, which is quite overt, quite significant, you've got to also remember the uh, condition of an X-cling hydrocephaly, which is seen in 5% of the cases, but it has got a very high recurrence risk of 50% in males. Otherwise, this over dilated ventricle megalies have a multifactorial pattern of inheritance. Now, 5% of ventricular megaly are associated with infections, typically it's CMB, Toxo, and Zika. And um, the cause for ventricular megaly is simply obstructive or it could be in a secondary to cerebral atrophy, or it could just be in the acute phase <clears throat> that there's an excess production of uh, CNS by inflammation of the arachnoid granulations that is leading to the dilatation. And therefore, infection screen is mandatory. But do remember that amnio-PCR for CMB toxo is performed after 20 weeks if you want to get the proper yield. And we can rely on the serological testing. When we do the IgM and IgG, we know that <clears throat> a negative IgM and IgG means there's no exposure. If you have a positive IgG with a negative IgM, that means there is a, there is a prior infection and immunity. But if you have a positive IgM and low ability IgG, that means there's been a recent infection that we need to repeat the uh, torch again in three weeks, in three months. So uh, the idea here is when you find that you have uh, isolated ventricle megaly, 
you've done all the testing, you have found no other abnormality, you advise serial scans. So scan these patients every four weeks and see whether it remains stable, it regresses like how it did in Dr. Santosh's case, or it progresses. And the risk of neurological delay will vary accordingly. Therefore, you cannot promise too much at the time of anomaly scan. You also got to remember that the anomaly is not visible initially, may be seen in 13% of cases when you do an MRI or you follow them patients after 26 weeks. And therefore, as the, uh, the ventricular megaly, the size increases, the risk of neurodevelopmental delay also increases. And the outcomes of isolated ventricular megaly vis-a-vis a normal, neuro, neuro, normal neurodevelopmental uh, delay is also dependent on the size criteria. <clears throat> Obviously, when you have a severe ventricular megaly, almost 60% of these patients or this group will have an abnormal neurodevelopmental outcome, whereas a mild um, has got an excellent neurodevelopmental outcome. <clears throat> but do remember that whenever you see this, additional abnormalities can be seen in uh, postnatal MRIs almost up to almost 10%. And this data is from an exhaustive study by Nathan Probably This is the most frequently referred paper for ventricular megaly. And I urge all of you to go through that once. So the approach should be that you diagnose and you first identify, then you grade it into mild, moderate, severe. Do an extended neurosonograms, find out other cranial abnormalities, do a comprehensive structural scan. If you do not find any other abnormality, we say this is an apparently isolated ventricular megaly. Then you offer genetic testing and infection screen, <clears throat> genetic consultation, and MRI should come into picture after 20 weeks. If everything done is normal, then we say that this is truly isolated ventricular megaly and you scan the feta every four weeks to see whether it regresses or remains static. So when you have to counsel women who have mild ventricular megaly in between 10 and 12, after a complete evaluation, we can say that the outcome is favorable, but there has to be that rider that two isolated ventricular megaly is a diagnosis of exclusion. You got to still remember that you cannot say it's with certainty until after birth. Now, this is a very strong statement, but yes, 10 to 12 mm generally tend to do good. When you have an isolated moderate ventricular megaly, these patients also do favorably well, but there's again that 4% risk of neurodevelopmental abnormalities that needs to be counseled to the patient. So the counseling is quite tricky because we don't know what can come up much later. You can have a sulcation gyration abnormality, which can come up at 26 weeks. You can have something which is unexpected coming out in the postnatal MRI. And the worst thing is when these patients come to you, they, are, they generally come at the 20 week scan. So you don't have much time to genetically work on them. And therefore you got to counsel the patients accordingly. So the take home message is uh, grade your ventricle sizes by measuring them in the right way. As we have just discussed, we remember that mild ventricular megaly can be associated with aneuploidy, infections, or intracerebral hemorrhage. Isolated while ventricular megaly, if you have really excluded everything and which is not progressive, will definitely have a very good outcome with normal developmental milestones and therefore you need just a serial scans and the strongest take-home point is that an isolated ventricular megaly is not a diagnosis. It is just a stepping stone ultrasound finding that you step on and then follow the methodology to exclude other abnormalities and then can finally come to a conclusion. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir, for your excellent, excellent presentation. It was uh, a deep learning for all of us. And um, with the permission of uh, respected faculty, can I take a few questions which are there in the group? Yes, of course. Sir. Yes, sir. So Dr. Fiona has two questions. One is earliest gestation at which you can use uh, CVR. 
Also, is genetic testing recommended in CPAM and BPS? Pravin sir, would you yeah. like to begin? Am I audible? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Um, first, first question is that uh, regarding the CPAM and uh, bronchopulmonary sequestration, um, genetic testing is not really required. It's not uh, mandatory. That is one. Second uh, thing is that um, uh, how early? Um, see, that is the reason why the CVR is uh, planned from 18 to 24 is the first uh, ultrasound examination then 25 to 29, and that, that's how you progress. So as early as 18 to 24, you can uh, take the CBR. Thank you, sir. Also in the same context, they ask, uh, what are the postnatal follow-up details for these cases? Postnatal? Follow-ups for, for CPAP. So th th that's exactly what I said, is that when you take the CVR into consideration, based on the CVR, if it is, uh, I mean, uh, more than 1.6, positively we are dealing that there can be an 80% uh, association with, uh, uh, sorry, uh, high data, I mean high drops. And the other situation is that the requirement of uh, 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 respiratory support in within 24 hours is when you have a US2, that is uh, be between 25 to 29 weeks of gestation, when the CVR is 0.39 or more, then you definitely require that, that is, has to be kept in mind. And whenever it is more than 0 0.80 CVR in the third scan, that is a 30 weeks associated with media sternship, definitely we need to think in terms of a possible surgical intervention within two years of uh, uh, afterwards. So this is how you uh, categorize based on the CVR. And would you uh, routinely advise a CT scan irrespective of CVR after delivery or all CVR? No, postnatal, yes. I mean, the mandatory, it has been made mandatory that postnatally you have to. And usually what they suggest is, you need, I mean, it, it has to be done about four to four days to one week and postnatally. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, uh, for Dr. Mohit, uh, there is this question by Dr. Shilpi who says, uh, went, mild ventriculomegaly, 11 millimeter. They have not mentioned bilateral or unilateral, so presuming unilateral. At 24 weeks, how would you like to proceed? Well, it's the same thing. You just walk up the case completely. And because it's 24 weeks, look at the sulcations, gyrations, obturations would have uh, been seen now. So uh, you treat it as a mild ventriculomegaly. You have to offer... Uh, genetic testing and an infection scale, apart from doing a comprehensive fetal neurosonogram. The same method. So any tricks you would like to offer for breech babies at 24 weeks, how to evaluate the CMS? Well, uh, it's, uh, it need not always be a transvaginal neurosonogram, provided you're going able to get all the views on a, even in a breech baby. I don't think that's uh, a difficult preposition that we're talking of. And when we're talking of a small fetus, it eventually does turn. Okay, it's only when you have a late gestation that we are worried and that's where MR scores slightly better over ultrasound. And even in high BMI patients where you really cannot see, that's where MR could probably give you additional findings. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, um, so on the respected faculties, uh, would you like to kind of give concluding remarks? on today's session. Mohit, sir. Oh. You want me to conclude the entire thing? <laughs> I just wanted to thank everyone, really. No, I mean, uh, no, of course. No, I would like to thank the Society of Fetal Medicine Pune chapter, Greater Pune chapter. I mean, see, the thing is, um, it is always a fantastic beginning that we started the first program on chat. Every time we add new uh, things to the um, knowledge of the people. I mean, it's always good to have interesting cases coming up and being discussed. Uh, gives you a proper perspective. And I wish that you keep doing that more and more often. I thank all the delegates there, all the faculty, and all the panelists, all the case presentations, Yogesh, uh, yourself, Chinmay, and Dr. Santosh, Kurana sir and Praveen sir, as always, uh, been the most important um, guidance to youngsters like us. 
thank you so very much and you can thank the uh, sort of uh, trade partners here absolutely yeah. sir uh, can i say one word yes sir of course yeah uh, i think it was wonderful uh, i mean the way the presenters has presented particularly uh, yogesh as well as the images were wonderful uh, yogesh as well as uh, santosh uh, i was really impressed with the the quality of the images yes. of course chinna you didn't have much of image so <laughs> <laughs> i find it great i'm being honest <laughs> thank you thank and you wonderful you. congratulations it was a great great evening thank you so much sir thanks for the guidance thank you sir uh, uh, kurana sir would you like to kind of guide yeah, us i'm just so impressed with the new method that are evolving for uh, our web meetings um we've had uh, just pure panel discussion we've had case discussions and this time we had a case plus an expert it's it's wonderful and you know i think it's just such a nice interactive way of learning and making sure that even though we're giving the same message again and again each one of us is learning from each one of these in every single program there's something and i really want to congratulate pune for putting in two such excellent programs in such a short time and i'm looking forward to those other excellent ideas the the journal club and and so on uh, and we look forward to those as well excellent job done one i think ashok we need to recognize or realize that uh, every time uh, one uh, chapter comes up with a new idea it's really really wonderful these young brains are really sharp and yes. brilliant yes and these ideas uh, because everyone is just so involved and it's it's fantastic we we've come across so many uh, program these days which you see advertised we have 11 photographs in the mailer and everybody has an inauguration and everybody's wasting everybody's time and here it's pure hardcore learning with a permanent uh, filing on our sfm youtube channel so i'd also request all of you to remember that you must tune into our sfm youtube channel make sure that you uh, like it and that you press the notifications button so every time we put up a new thing it comes up there it takes us on an average about 6 to 7 weeks uh, to get the permissions and the, then the whole session is there so i encourage members to truly uh, start subscribing to our sfm youtube channel for all the repeats thank you thank you thank you very much and good night thank you thank you good night uh, before we forget uh, should i ask vishal to just play our trade partner videos and <laughs> at every every small point in this journey of learning giving us this opportunity to present to you and interact with you and audience for being here so late at the night on the working day thanks to vishal for uh, being a wonderful host and hosting us on this platform today and thanks to trade uh, partners so uh, just to cite newton if we can see further it's by standing on shoulders of giants so truly thanks to you all the giants for giving us this platform thank you so much It's our pleasure, Chinmay. Very well conducted. Beautiful images. Thank you. Bye. Good night, sir. Bye. Bye. Hope to see.